Welcome back to the Constitutional Clarion. This one, I promise, is my last video about the coronation and then I will get back to serious stuff. This one is going to be again about regalia. And this time it's all the various sticks and orbs and armels and ampullas and spoons and all those other little fascinating things that were presented to the monarch during the coronation. And the question is why? What are they about? What were they for? So let's start with the spoon and the ampulla. And they are used in the anointing of the monarch, which is the most sacred part of the coronation. And as you will have noticed if you watched, uh, this was all hidden behind a screen. So unfortunately, we didn't really get to see any of this. But the spoon itself is interesting because it's the only part of the regalia that actually survived uh, Cromwell's uh, efforts to sell it off and melt it down and get rid of all these symbols of monarchy. Uh, what had happened was that a fellow called Clement Kinnersley uh, was working in the area where they were doing the job of, you know, melting down the gold or selling off the bits and pieces, and he bought for himself this coronation spoon. And then after the restoration of Charles II, he probably thought that his complicity in this selling off of the regalia might cause him some trouble. So he donated back to Charles II this coronation spoon. The spoon itself is interesting because unlike a normal spoon, which has a, a, a dip that you drink from, this one has what's called two lobes in it. So it has two little dips because the idea is you put your finger in it two fingers in it like that and then you get the oil on your fingers and then as Archbishop of Canterbury you can make the sign of the cross on the head and the breast and the hands of the king from the spoon and so that's what it's used for. Now before you do that you need something to hold the oil, the holy oil with which the king is blessed and that comes from an ampulla. Now the original ampulla was melted down by Cromwell and friends and so Charles II wanted uh, a, an identical one created. Now, prior to the Republic, uh, the oil used to anoint the king had supposedly come from Thomas of Becket, who received it in a dream from the Virgin Mary. Not quite sure how that works, but in any event, this particular oil was kept in a file which was in the shape of an eagle. So. Charles II wanted his ampulla in the shape of an eagle. So we have this rather beautiful gold eagle that was made. Uh, it's an eagle that can be easily decapitated because you twist off its head and that's how you put the oil in and you put its head back on and to get the oil out, the little hole is in its beak. So you tip it over, put it in your spoon and then do your anointing. Now let's go next to the orb. So what's the orb supposed to represent? Well, it's supposed to represent the world, um, the world at least at the time that it was known um, back in Charles II's time or indeed before. So orbs were previously used. There are many portraits of people like Elizabeth I with an orb and an orb was recreated by Charles II. It has, it's made of gold. It is a hollow sphere and it has 365 diamonds on it one for each day of the year. And it also has nine sapphires and nine emeralds and 18 rubies on it. The mond, which is the round bit on top of the orb, is made from a large amethyst. And above the mond is a cross, which symbolizes the sovereignty of Christ over the world. If you have a good look at the cross, it's a little bit wonky. And that is because when Captain Blood in 1671 tried to steal the crown jewels and was caught in the act and ran away, he and his um, confederate, well, it was his colleague in theft who shoved the orb down his trousers and ran for it. And the orb unfortunately fell out and in the falling out made the cross a little bit wonky. So that's why it's just slightly off center. Now this brings us to scepters. And so the two most important ones, being the two that are held by the king, are the scepter with the dove and the scepter with the cross. Now, the scepter with the cross is held in the king's right hand 
And that scepter symbolizes kingly power, governance, and the rule of law. The scepter with the dove is held in his left hand when he is crowned, and that symbolizes equity and mercy. Now, why are these two things important? They're important because at the very point of time that he is being crowned king with the crown on his head, symbolizing all the powers that kings had, and they had quite a lot more in the past, it, he was feeling the weight in his arms of the limits on that power. And they are the limits of the law in his right hand and of how that law should be exercised with equity and mercy in his left hand. So you have rule of law and you also have the morality that needs to be used to temper the exercise of the law. Now, if you're a particular law geek, uh, you might want to think of it in terms of common law in the right hand, rod of equity in the left hand, no fusion fallacies going on here. But I'll leave that for the law geeks. Everybody else can just pass that one by. The scepter with the cross is the one that has the very spectacular Cullinan diamond in it, otherwise known as the Great Star of Africa. It didn't originally have that diamond in, it was added later on. The diamond itself was mined in South Africa in a mine outside Pretoria um, in a place called Cullinan, named after the owner of the mine, Thomas Cullinan. And the government at the time, the Transvaal government, uh, paid for the diamond and then presented it as a birthday gift to King Edward VII. And part of the reason for doing so was to try and uh, smooth over the relationship with the United Kingdom after the Boer War. Now that diamond was put into the scepter with the cross for the coronation of George V and has been there ever since. And again, is quite spectacular if you see it in real life. Along with sticks, we have swords, many swords. So there are three swords that have a particular legal aspect to them. So there is the Sword of Mercy, that's known as the Kirtana, and it's blunt at the end to symbolise that as a knight you have mercy because you're not going to stab the person through. Secondly, there is the Sword of Spiritual Justice, which is supposed to represent the role of the king in the church. And thirdly, we have the Sword of Temporal Justice, which represents the king's role in the courts. Now, in addition to those, and the most important sword is the Sword of State that you would have seen Penny Mordaunt carrying for a very long time around during the coronation ceremony. And this Sword of State is also used in other ceremonies as well when the, the sovereign is there. Charles II created uh, this sword, again, as a, uh, in imitation of previous swords, in 1660. But because the sword was actually used quite a bit, they decided to create a second one as well, which was made in 1667. Uh, this is the sword that we have today. The earlier one was lost somewhere, so perhaps someone in the United Kingdom has it hidden in a cupboard. But anyway, the 1667 one is the one that is still used. Uh, it's in a wooden scabbard, but the scabbard is covered in crimson velvet uh, with gold wrapping around it and symbols on it of the various countries over which Charles II claimed dominion. Now, in addition to those swords, we have what's known as the Sword of Offering. And that is the most spectacular jeweled sword, uh, much smaller than the Sword of State. And that is a sword that was created by our four, George IV, who was certainly a man who was quite keen on his bling. So this particular sword was um, covered in jewels. It cost him £6,000 and he paid for it out of his own pocket, which is rather surprising. And uh, this sword is offered uh, to the church on the altar and then is redeemed for a price of money. So 100 silver shillings is the um, price traditionally paid. So you would have seen that at the coronation ceremony. Again, Penny Mordaunt taking that sword to the altar and then the money being placed on the altar and then the sword coming back. The sword of offering is also intended to symbolize um, knighthood and chivalry. And in that regard, we also have the spurs, the golden spurs. Now these golden spurs, the right to 
present them to the monarch, um, has been fought over by various families for a long time, all of which claiming they come from a particular ancestor who was given that right many, many, many centuries ago. Spurs were originally presented to Richard the Lionheart in his coronation. Of course, they were again melted down by Oliver Cromwell. So the spurs that are now used are spurs that were created for the coronation of Charles II. In the past, monarchs used to wear the spurs on their feet as a sign of their chivalry, uh, even female monarchs. So Mary Tudor, for example, fastened the spurs to her feet. These days, not so much. So in more recent times, they used to just touch them to the ankles of a king. But when Queen Elizabeth II and Queen Victoria were there, that was seen to be um, uh, rather impertinent. So they would just touch them with their hands. It was interesting during the coronation of King Charles III that he decided to again just touch them with his hands rather than having anyone put them against his ankles or indeed trying to get him to wear them. I imagine with all the traipsing around in very heavy robes, the last thing you want is spurs on your feet to trip you up. So seems a reasonably sensible idea not to actually be wearing them. Then we have the armals or armalay. So again, originally these were um, golden bracelets that a monarch wore. Uh, they go back to ancient Roman times where these were worn as symbols of um, military victory. They were sort of like honors for people who were um, courageous in war. And uh, again, melted down and new ones created for Charles II. The peculiar thing here is um, there are uh, different accounts in different books that you read. Many books say that there was a mistranslation at some point and somebody thought that armalay meant a stole that was used around the monarch and they stopped using these bracelets. Other people say that the bracelets have been used all the way back um, and were used by George VI. Uh, I did have a look at some photos to try and see whether he was wearing them or not, but unfortunately all the photos I could see of his coronation, he had a, um, a, a cloak over his wrists, so couldn't really see whether he actually used them or not. So the blurbs that have come out have said that King Charles was using the same ones that his grandfather had used. Uh, but according to some of the books that I've read, the answer is no, they were not used. And that the mistake um, about it was recognised before the coronation of Elizabeth II. And at that point, the various Commonwealth realms said, well, if you haven't been using these armalay or armals for a long time, let us create them so that you have new parts of your regalia that, are, uh, that represent the realms um, of which you are head of state. And so that's what they did. There was a new set of um, armals created for Queen Elizabeth II. Now, the curious thing is that Charles III went back to the earlier armals that had been created for Charles II, uh, even though it seems that historically they hadn't been used, and he rejected the ones that had been made by the Commonwealth realms. Now, there could have been an argument that the reason for doing that was that those earlier ones made for Elizabeth II might be too small for his wrists because he's a man. Maybe that would be the, the uh, I thought to myself, maybe that was the reason. But interestingly, he didn't put them on at all. Uh, Elizabeth II wore hers. You can see them on all the photographs. But all Charles did was just stick a finger on them and touch them. And I think that's a real pity because the realms really did get seriously wiped out of this coronation ceremony. First of all, the oath didn't mention them, so no mention at all of Australia in the entire ceremony. All they got to do was trot in with some flags at the beginning, and frankly, they did that in 1911. So we moved back to pre-Statute of Westminster times when we were all part of one indivisible crown, which is a real pity. Finally, we have the coronation ring. So the coronation ring, uh, originally they were rings made for each particular monarch, so it wasn't one that got passed on. But the one made by William the, for William IV um, was passed on and uh, was expected to be a, a um, part of the regalia that would be used again in the future. Now, that is a very large sapphire, which has little bits of rubies going across it in the shape of a cross and is surrounded by 14 diamonds. Problem, however, was that William IV's successor was Queen Victoria. She was a young woman with very small hands and there was no way 
this particular ring was going to fit on her fingers. So she had another one that was a replica of it, looked exactly the same, but much smaller, made for her hand. Now, here's where the big mistake was made. The ring was to go on the fourth finger of the right hand. Now, the jewellers, when preparing the ring, decided you don't count the thumb, and so the fourth finger was the little finger, and that's the ring that they designed it for and the right size of. The Archbishop of Canterbury, however, knew better because when it said the fourth finger of your right hand, it actually meant, yes, the ring finger. And so when it came to putting the ring on, the ring that had been made for the little finger had to be put on the fourth finger. And so the Archbishop rather brutally jammed it on, um, causing poor Queen Victoria quite a bit of pain and a lot of difficulty getting it off. Um, she had to soak her hand in ice ice water in order to shrink the finger enough to be able to get the ring off. So there's one story. You just need to be absolutely sure which ring it is that you're putting your, uh, which finger it is you're putting your ring on. The other thing I've never really understood is that there is also a gift to the monarch, which is a gauntlet for the right hand, uh, which you then use when you're holding your scepters. Uh, and again, this is one of those historical things where families or people that own a particular area of land uh, have the right to provide this particular glove. But given how big the ring is, seems to me rather odd that you then have to stick a rather a big glove over it. Or maybe the point of it is so that the ring doesn't end up scratching the scepter. I don't know, but in any event, what happened with King Charles's coronation is that again, he just touched the ring and he never put it on which strikes me as rather odd. If you're going to have the ring, which is supposed to be, as Queen Elizabeth I said, the wedding ring between you and the country, surely you have to put the ring on. Apparently not, because it didn't happen. Anyway, thank you for listening to my video on the various bits of regalia, and thank you for watching The Clarion. We will return to normal offering of proper constitutional things in the next videos, and I hope to see you then. Thank you.